there are so many references um, to the, the heart, the mouth, the lips actually and the tongue. And we've actually grouped the, the tongue and the lips in with the mouth, if, if you don't mind, um, to, to link to, to the heart in that way. Um, and, and, and so much of it is linked to, to wisdom, understanding and knowledge. But if we just look at, for example, how many references firstly are in the, in the Bible in total for the word heart, 830 times versus 81 times in Proverbs, so quite, quite some number in, in Proverbs themselves. References to the mouth, 424 times and 52 times in, in Proverbs. Um, quite a few references in the Bible generally for the tongue, 19 times in, in Proverbs, and 42 times in Proverbs for the lips, 119 in total. So it gives you an idea of how many times we see references to the heart and mouth in Scripture versus the book of Proverbs. And what we'll find is, is how many times these references, as we've alluded to, are linked to last week's subject on, on wisdom, understanding and knowledge. So over 31 chapters in Proverbs, the heart averages 2.6 times per chapter and the mouth, including the tongue and the lips, averages 3.6 times per chapter. Well, Brother Luke, if, if you came last week, Brother Luke gave a, a really quite nice analogy to, to the tree. Um, and, and what he described was in this way, that if you imagine the roots are drawing up knowledge and understanding and wisdom, and the fact that that can be interchangeable, growing into the trunk, and then the wisdom growing forth from the branches and the leaves, and that was quite a nice analogy that we can quite nicely link to. It's very much an extension of that. So by drawing out and, and accepting God's instruction and words of wisdom, we can then change our natural heart, our, our natural wicked heart, and, uh, and change then our, our mouths it's intrinsically c connected to that. So it's very much an extension of, of this uh, this subject from last week of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And we can actually read in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. So in effect, by accepting God's instruction into our hearts or in, into our roots and into our hearts, we can grow through knowledge and understanding, or, or, or as we see the, the trunk here, and we can speak God's wisdom from our healthy branches and leaves or, or the words in our mouths. But of course, we have to contrast the tree of life where we draw up God's wisdom, God's instruction to the opposite of that. And of course, the book of Proverbs is very much a book of contrast as we saw last week. And when it comes to the heart and mouth, it speaks in the same way. From a negative sense, if we ignore God's wisdom and let our roots only absorb, absorb man's wisdom into our hearts, our mouths and our hearts will reflect that of, of, of what we accept and draw up and will ultimately lead to death and no access to the tree of life. And so we see in this analogy again a, a, a dying tree uh, where man's knowledge, man's wisdom, without that instruction from the word by refusing God's instruction by not seeking after and acknowledging God we then absorb the, the wisdom of men the foolishness of men and the same then goes for our hearts and our mouths if we don't change our hearts man's natural hearts if we don't accept God's instruction if we refuse it then what comes out of our mouths is ungodly reflecting man's natural deceitful heart well, we know this deceitful heart goes right back to the beginning in Eden, doesn't it? Um, as we know uh, with the serpent. So let's just dip into that as we preamble into our subject tonight. So if we, if we go back to, to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said... Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, 
you shall not surely die. So the serpent said, they spoke unto the woman, you shall not surely die. And then verse 13, the, the Lord God said unto the wisdom, what is this that, that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled or deceived me and I did eat. So the serpent deceived Eve through the subtlety of of a crafty and mischievous way of the serpent's mouth. And it's interesting, the word subtle, which is the Hebrew 6175, uh, means cunning, crafty and shrewd. And it's quite interesting to see that, again, thinking of the contrast here, the same word in the opposite sense is used in Proverbs to describe the prudent the prudent man. So the, that word prudent is exactly the same word, but the opposite to how it's being used in, in Genesis here as the word um, subtle. We can see that in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16. First of all, let's just go to Proverbs chapter 10, 7, verse 10, and just see that same, same word, subtle. And behold, there met him, him a woman, chapter 7, verse 10, with the attire of an harnet and subtle of heart. So this is that strange woman that, again, Brother Luke referred to. And the contrast, of course, of that is, is the virtuous woman that uh, Brother Dave will speak of next week. So that's that same word. And then if we look at chapter 12, verse 16, we see the opposite, same, same word, but being used in the opposite sense. A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covers shame. And chapter 23, sorry, um, ch chapter 13, verse 16. Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. In chapter 14, <coughs> verse 15, the simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his, to his going. So in the same way that Eve was deceived by this, this same word, this subtle, the, the opposite here is we're seeing the prudent man dealing with knowledge, and that's again linking to last week's subject, and we demonstrate that as we go through. And then we see a continuation of that um, from Genesis. In, in, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, we see that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Hebrew word signifies not only the imagination, but also the purposes and the desires. So we begin to see the connection of the nat natural man's heart being the 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 centre of our purposes and desires and being desperately wicked to the, to the point, obviously, at this point where God destroyed the world in the flood. So in other words, the very springs of human action are defiled. And in this case, there was only one remedy for such a disease, the eradication of the generation of Noah who walked with God, sorry, with the exception of, of Noah who walked with God and his family. And so in, in its natural, unenlightened state, the heart of man receives no commendation in the scriptures. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Is, is, this, is the divine declaration from Jeremiah. And Jesus confirms this when he states, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, and these defile a man. So it's this, it's this word... Um, Yetzer, um, as I say, it's translated as an imagination, and it's the form um, of, of, of natural man, the imagination of the heart in this way. And we've, we, see, we see that, as we say, in, in Genesis, but also in, in relation to Solomon, we can read in 1 Chronicles, And now, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the, th of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. 
But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. So, having set this context, we want to now briefly consider the heart and mouth as separate words and how the natural heart and mouth of man is described before we consider their relationship. So again, we want to get into the, to the meaning of the words here, the heart, the mouth, the tongue, and the lips, because when you get into the, the, the Hebrew words, it's actually quite fascinating how it all is linked together and how much is, 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 is linked between what's, what enters into our heart, what comes out of our mouth, what, how we speak and how we use our lips in a good way or a bad way. Was the word heart is mostly in, in Proverbs um, um, and in Scripture generally translated from Strong's 3820. Um, so it's translated as the heart 508 times. But you can see here sometimes it is translated as under, understanding. So even though we, from a purely anatomical sense... Our heart isn't our mind. It is considered to be the centre of our understanding, our inner thoughts, as, as we see on the next slide. So it's inner man. It's our, it's, our, it's our mind, it's our heart, it's our understanding. It's the heart and soul of man. It's our inclination, our, our, our resolution and determination. And, and it's, our, it's the seat of our emotions and passions. So then, what does it say, naturally say, what does Proverbs say about the, the natural heart of man? Continuing this, this theme, it, it, it speaks quite widely in the same way. So pride, it hates instruction, despises reproof, froward or contrary, lust, deviseth mischief, deviseth wickedness. The imaginations, that's that same word again that we saw in Genesis, subtle, led astray, foolish, perverse, deceitful, backslider, haughty, and envy. And we, we see that in some of these references. There's so many references, I have to apologise, I've, I've got a lot on the slides, but if anybody wants the slides afterwards, they can have them. Because it really just, you see how many times it repeats this same message. So in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 12, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof? Frowardness is in his heart. He, he deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief. Proverbs 6, 25, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. This is refer referring to this harlot or, or strange woman. And Proverbs chapter 12, Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but to the counsellors of peace is joy. And, and there's, there's, there's several more um, Again, the book of contrast, this is the, 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 the evil side of our, of our natural man's heart and how it talks about the, mouth, the, the heart in this way. So then if we look at the mouth, uh, in, intrinsically linked to that, so Strong 6310, predominantly um, translated as mouth um, in, in this sense. I, but I think when you look into the biblical usage, um, you see, it's, it's, a, it's a mouth, it's an opening, it's an orifice, and it's interesting those are the words of a well or a river, and we'll come on to look at that later. But you see also in the Strong's definition this reference to a two-edged, and we know there's two-edged sword, um, and again, we can connect that with other terminology within, within, the, within the scriptures. So it's in other words, it can be used for good and evil from the same mouth. We can imagine with this reference to it being a, an orifice or a well or a river. In other words, the, the mouth spilling out what's in the heart or, or a deep well or the opening of a river. So it's the point at which whatever's in our heart gets spilt out in, in the same way as the opening of, of a wide river. And if we can remember that point, we'll, we'll touch back onto this deep well, um, this, this, this opening, this river uh, that that's, this is being used in this sense. So again, if we look at the, the mouth, you see the continual uh, theme, throw it again, contrary, perverse, wicked, ab abomination. So these are all linked uh, to the mouth and very much similar to what we've seen in the heart. Um, evil, pride, arrogancy, violence, 
foolish, hypocrite, wickedness, destruction, deceit, and flattery. The word froward actually is a, is a person difficult to deal with, or contrary, as we said. And the biblical sense is one habitually disposed to disobedience and opposition. Doesn't that just sum up the, the heart of natural man? Headstrong, self-willed, willfully disobedient, not obeying or complying with the commands of those in authority. And so similar words spoken of about the mouth, it being a froward froward mouth, so put away the froward mouth and perverse lips. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish, it foolish is near destruction. And hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth, destroyeth his neighbour, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, and the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. And that's, that's that, again, that, that, that analogy of whatever's in our hearts, if it's, it is wicked, it will pour out of our mouth, it will pour out foolishness. And then with, allow me just to add to that that the tongue, because we know that the, the tongue is, is, is translated the tongue, but also language and, and being a babbler. Um, so we saw the mouth was the opening, but the, the, the end of the river, whereas the, the tongue is the organ of speech and denotes the type of language, the type of language that comes out from the heart and the mouth. So it's the organ of speech. And it, 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 you see it being used as a fork of flame if it's, if it's associated with wickedness. A babbler, an evil speaker, a talker, a tongue or a wedge. And we see that again, consistent theme coming through. It's referencing lying, flattery, throw it again, perverse, naughty, backbiting, <coughs> backed up by references, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood to keep them from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, but the froward tongue shall be cut out. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. Proverbs 7, He that hath a froward heart findeth no good, and he that hath a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. So again, we see in, 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 in a lot of this context that, that keeping away from the evil woman from the flattery of the tongue of the strange woman, which will contrast that with the virtuous woman next week, God willing. And then we add the lips into it. Uh, where again, it's, it's connected with language and speech. Um, it talks about being a border. And that, this is an interesting point when we think about shutting the lips. So when we don't want to say anything that we shouldn't say, this is the point that we can control it. It's the border, the boundary between actually speaking something evil and just holding back or uh, lying um, and babbling or... Um, just basically preventing words coming out that we shouldn't be saying. So prating is talking foolishly. A prating fool is someone who goes on and on without any purpose. Someone who's swift to speak and slow to hear. Swift to speak and slow to hear, which is the opposite of what James instructs, as we know in, in chapter 1 of James, where it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, also slow to speak and slow to wrath. So the opposite of prating. As I say, it's fascinating when you think of the lips as this edge or shore or this bank of the cup or the sea or the river. So again, it's that, 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 that deep well, a river, and then this, this shore, this bank, this boundary of which we can either control what's in our mouths by shutting our mouths or say something positive, something from God, God's wisdom. A natural boundary by implication. So it's the point at which we can shut her open to stop speech coming out if, if that's necessary. And of course, the lips of natural man, same theme, perverse, flattery, lying, slander, transgression, burning fire. Moving his lips bringeth evil to pass, false, contentious, talebearer, mischief and deceit. 
uh, lots of uh, uh, verses around this, froward mouth and perverse lips, flattering of her lips, lying lips, transgression of his lips. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is a burning fire. A fool's lips enters into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a, nat- a, a naughty tongue. So the relationship then of natural of a, na- of a natural man's heart and mouth we see are the consistent. You get the same terminology, the same words, pride, proud and haughty, out of the mouth, pride, hates instruction, arrogancy. Same word, froward, contrary, froward, contentious, perverse on both sides, devising wicked imaginations, wicked, naughty, evil, devising mischief, destruction, tailbearer, backbiting, deceitful, lying, false, subtle, flattery, and so on and so on, despises reproof, abomination, led astray, hypocrite. And so we, we, we reflect on the, the words of, of Matthew 15, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come far forth from the heart and they defile the man, natural man's heart. Whatever comes from a natural man's heart defiles the man. And so the connection is obvious. The state of our heart affects what comes out of our mouths, or to put it another way, what we say is a reflection of our heart. Proverbs 3 verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. So if, if, our, if, our, if our hearts haven't been influenced by the wisdom of God, then our mouths will effectively reflect that and reflect the heart, the, the heart of man by what we say and what we do. So if we come back to the, to the tree that we referenced at the tart start, again extending the, the thoughts of Brother Luke from, from last week. Uh, remember, we, we looked, when we looked at the meaning of the heart, we saw it resembling the, the off orifice of a well or a river. In other words, the, the mouth spilling out what's in the heart, or, or a deep well, or the opening of a river. Well, if we look at Proverbs 20, verse 5, we see counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. But a man of understanding will draw it out. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Or the ESV, the purpose in, in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. So understanding helps us to draw out what's right in this, this deep water of natural man's feelings that's, that's needed for, for the mouth to speak with understanding and, and grace. So preparing the heart through instilling wisdom, understanding and knowledge will ensure the answer of the tongue or our speech will be from the Lord. So the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So contrary to natural man's dying uh, a nature, we have to draw on God's instruction, accept God's instruction, uh, draw it up like deep water and prepare the heart of the man such that the answer of the tongue is, is, is from the Lord. So we can begin to build this picture of the relationship between the heart and the mouth, but Proverbs is packed full of advice. So what does it say are the different things we should be doing with our mouths? And what state does our heart need to be in to achieve this? So this is where we, we put away the, 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 the negative of, the, of man's heart and look at the, the positives that we can, we can change our heart and our mouths by, by turning to God and, and his wisdom. So to begin changing the imaginations that, that, that we read of again from, from Genesis 
chapter 8, to, to ch change the imaginations of man's wicked heart, we need to start by seeking God and letting him into our hearts. So the roots of that tree need to start seeking God early days and letting him into our hearts. And Proverbs demonstrates the relationship between the heart and the mouth through contrast, as we've said, as it does through, for much of the book. So if we turn to Proverbs chapter 2, we see this, this build. Well, let's start at the, 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 the beginning, actually. Verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear into wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding... Yea, if thou criest, that's that seeking after, crying after knowledge and lifting up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So out of God's mouth comes knowledge and understanding, and so we have to turn to to that wisdom, to, to find that uh, knowledge and understanding. And we won't turn all these references up because we've got quite, quite some on the screen. Proverbs 15, verse 14, The heart of him that, uh, that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. So the, the, the opposite of seeking after knowledge, the mouth feeding on foolishness. The sacrifice... Proverbs 15, verse 8, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer, prayer of the upright is his delight. So again, seeking God in prayer, seeking his knowledge and his understanding will influence what comes out of our mouth. And we need to acknowledge him then. Having sought after him, we then need to acknowledge him in our lives. So Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. And then we see the opposite of that in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1. My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding. Verse 7. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honour unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. So we need to acknowledge God after we sought after him, giving him glory to him alone. And having then sought after him, acknowledged God, we then start to see very much a link to Luke's subject last, last week. And, and, and there's so many times that the heart is associated with wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And I was quite glad he didn't reference that too often last week. As you see, there's an abundance of references that having, a, having sought after acknowledge God, then we have to build the wisdom and understanding to change our, our hearts. Proverbs 2 so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding. Verse 10, when wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Chapter 8, O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. Chapter 10, verse 8, the wise in heart will receive commandments. Receive commandments, so that's that. You know, those roots, accepting the instruction, accepting the commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. Chapter 14, wisdom resteth in the heart of him that hath understanding, but that which is in the midst of fools is made known. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. So it, it takes effort, doesn't it? It's not going to just happen just because we've sought after God and acknowledged him. We've got to study. We've got to build on that. We've got to build that understanding to influence what comes out of our mouth. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. And carries on. The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, 
There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, the reference we've seen. Man of understanding will draw it out. 22, bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Chapter 23, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice even mine. Hear thou, my son, be wise and guide the heart. My son, be wise and make my heart glad that I might, may answer him that reproacheth me. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. And so we need to build on that, uh, the, 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 the applying that understanding, studying the, and, 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 and building wisdom, knowledge, instruction and commandments. It's got to enter into our hearts. But then the Proverbs also speaks about having done that, we need to bind it upon our hearts. We need to keep it. We need to retain it. And we need to use it to guide us. So regularly we see a, 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 a repetition of, uh, my son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, in the centre of our thoughts, not the imaginations of our heart, but to keep God's word, God's wisdom in our hearts. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck and bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So repetition again, that, that it's not just about taking in that. We've got to bind it. We've got to retain it. We've got to keep it. So ensure them that we live it, we speak it uh, when we, we, we talk to people. And so exactly that, a changed heart leads to a changed mouth. And, and then and we'll see these references now to support this. So having sought after God, acknowledged him, applied, studied, understood wisdom, knowledge, instruction, commandments, written them, bound them, kept them and retained them. As a consequence, what comes out of our mouth, and this is all from references in Proverbs, we speak justly, righteousness, sweet, grace, pleasant kindness, wholesome, soft and humble. We have control of the mouth. We can re refrain, we can shut the lips, we can shut that natural boundary. We can shut natural man's thoughts coming out and we can use discretion. We can speak with wisdom, keeping and dispersing knowledge, speaking truth, answering from the Lord, increasing learning to others by what's in our hearts and in our minds and then using knowledge aright when we need to. And so what we'll do now is just pick out some of these um, words that we've got here on the right that, that then comes out of our mouths from the, some of the references in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4. A wholesome, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, as we've seen, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Proverbs 22, he that loveth pureness of heart for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. And as you would expect, we start to see uh, the benefits of, 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 of t taking on wisdom that we then don't do the opposite of that. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. So it, it very explicitly speaks about um, how, a, how, how lying is an abomination to the Lord. We see that in Proverbs chapter 12. So by taking on God's wisdom, the understanding and knowledge, we avoid doing these things. We speak truth as opposed to to lying. 
So Proverbs chapter 12, verse 17. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. So we think about that two-edged sword again. But the tongue of the wise is health. The lip of truth shall be established forever. The lip of truth shall be established forever. But a lying tongue is but, a, is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. But to the counsellors of peace is joy. There shall no evil happen to the just. But the wicked shall be filled with mischief. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord. But they that deal truly, that speak truth, are his delight. It's quite so stark, isn't that? That, that lying lips <coughs> are an abomination to the Lord and, and how hard it is, natural man, to avoid even white lies at times. And yet it says lying is an abomination to the Lord. And by taking on this understanding, wisdom and knowledge, we then increase learning. And the Proverbs once more speaks in this way. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8 and 9. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. So teach and re reprove, rebuke. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Proverbs 16, the wise in heart shall be called prudent. That, that contrast to the word subtle again, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. So we can use God's wisdom, God's understanding in our hearts to then speak and instruct and teach and increase in learning to others as well as ourselves. And from that wisdom in the heart, we also see our changed words, so sweetness, pleasantness, kindness and discretion we see in some of these references. And this is, again, a, a really important point that it that stresses, particularly this first reference in Proverbs chapter 12. And this is from the New King James Version. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. We're so easy, aren't we, to quick to criticise and judge, aren't we? It's so easy to to let that natural imaginations of the heart come out and criticise and judge one another. But we, we're taught that we should use good words to, to uplift, to build up others, and not to gossip or slander. Proverbs 17, He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who gossips about it, he who repeats a matter, separates friends. The words of a talebearer are as wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth. So this is the point. The heart of the wise stops us from saying all these things that, that destroy and upset and cause anxiety. It teaches the mouth and learning to the lips. And then pleasant words are like honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. And a froward or contrary man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends, moving his lips. So by opening our mouths and moving this boundary that we could actually shut at times, we bring evil to pass. So we, we don't do good, we do harm, rather than build one another up. And it's quick, isn't it, also to share someone's transgression, rather than keeping it to ourselves. And yet the proverb speaks so explicitly on that, doesn't it? And touching on that point, it teaches us to keep quiet, slow to speak. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth life, but he that openeth wide his lips. So opens that river, that orifice of natural man. If, 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 if we're not saying things that are coming from God, then we should keep our mouths shut to avoid destruction. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. That's that same, same theme of, of the opening of that river and, 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 and whatever's in our heart pouring out. And if it's wickedness, that's what will pour out. Proverbs 17, he that, knowledge, he that hath knowledge spareth his words. So even if we've got knowledge, we can spare our words at times and hold our peace. 
and he that shutteth his lips esteemed a man of understanding. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. <coughs> Through wisdom, then, we speak humbly and we esteem others better than ourselves. In the mouth of foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of wise shall preserve them. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Everyone that's proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord, in the same way as lying. And the heart of man is haughty, and before honour is humility. So speaking humbly and esteeming others. And again, this, this pleasant, kind and soft, soft words, a soft answer. We see in Proverbs 15 verse 1, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Receiving instruction and commandments and guiding, then we answer from the Lord and use knowledge aright. We've read, haven't we, the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord if we prepare our heart. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works to the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Well, advice is the easy part, isn't it? But can we put it into practice? And unfortunately, we have a, we have a book full of examples of faithful men and women putting these things into practice. And we have an example, of course, of one man who put all these things into practice from a child. And we'll br bring our thoughts to a conclusion now by looking at that. So our best example, as you would expect, of, of living exactly what we read in the Proverbs is, 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 is with Christ. And we'll look at some of these references. We can't obviously look at them all. Again, you can have the slide and look at those in your own time if you wish. But they're all familiar. But it, it, just, it just really highlights... Um, uh, how Christ lived a changed heart and a changed mouth um, by starting from a knowledge from a ch child. If we look at Luke chapter 2, we know, don't we? Luke chapter 2, verse 46, it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. So as a young child, he was, he was inquisitive, he was acknowledging and seeking, wasn't he? And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So all that heard him at that age were astonished at his understanding and his answers. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 54, and when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogues, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brother, brother James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? So they, they were astonished at his, 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 his wisdom and his knowledge and his mighty works. And so he built up knowledge. He acquired that, that knowledge from a child, as the proverb speaks. And then he spoke to God in prayer, numerously, didn't he? At, at difficult times, at times at his baptism, at times when he regularly withdrew, withdrew from the crowds, um, after healing people in the evening, before walking on the water, before choosing the twelve, before Peter's confession, and, and as we know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, before his crucifixion. So he, he had the wisdom and, and understanding to turn to God for, for, for guidance, to talk to his father in the way that it, it, it tells us in the Proverbs. And he gave glory to him alone. We can see by looking at a couple of the references again from John chapter 11.
John chapter 11, verse 40. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So this miracle that we know so well, he immediately made sure that the people knew it was from God and not him. So he gave glory to God, not to himself. And there's other references. Just quickly turn to chapter 14, verse 10. Chapter 14, verse 10. Believers now that not that I am in the Father and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So deep down in, 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 the, in the heart of Christ was his Father, his wisdom and his knowledge. And, and that's what he spoke. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. And as we know, he, he taught and he repro reproved through that wisdom. If you jump to Matthew 5, verse 2. This is at the Beatitudes. He opened his mouth and he taught them. And then he went into detail, didn't he? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the hung those that hunger and thirst. Thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So we need to empty out our pride the, the op the, and have the appetite um, of, of righteousness. We shall be filled Matthew 12, verse 34. It's quite explicit here, isn't he, in, in rebuking. O generation of vipers, verse 34, chapter 12. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speakers. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So the same message that we've got from Proverbs we see being spoken of by our Lord and Master. And speaking the truth in John chapter 8, we see, as we'd expect, John chapter 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, we know that um, Christ is a perfect example of somebody who kept quiet. And we'll just look at one of the references, Matthew chapter 27. All familiar words, but it just really doesn't it reinforce those, those proverbs and the, the, the relationship between the heart and mouth. So Proverbs chapter 27, when he was accused. When he was accused, verse 12, of the chief and priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word insomuch that the governor marvelled greatly. And of course we know of what it says in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. And you wonder whether Jesus himself was thinking of the, the words in the Ecclesiastes, the words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that, him that ruleth among fools. To everything there is a season and a time, to every purpose under the heaven, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. The last one, we just want to quickly look at no anger or violence, a soft answer. And we think about how he was betrayed by Judas in chapter 26. It's quite interesting when we consider the thoughts from Proverbs. If we look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 23, and he answered and said, 
He that dippeth his hand with me in this dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto him. So at this point he is rebuking. Woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. And then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. So he, he doesn't confirm it. Judas's words himself has, has betrayed him. Thou hast said. He knew full well. But he, he didn't say it himself. It was Judas's words that spoke it. Master, is it I? And then when it actually happens in verse 48, um, let's connect it to 47. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. So isn't it interesting that thinking of this context of, of the mouth and the lips, that Jude, Judas actually betrays him with a kiss. The supposed kiss of a friend, and yet Jesus' reaction is friend. Wherefore art thou come? No malice. Friend, wherefore art thou come? This is a different Greek word, which is more intense. So it's not a true friend or an acquaintance, but it's, it's the message it portrays, isn't it? That Judas has betrayed him with a kiss. And Jesus' response is soft, friend, why for art thou come? And so I, I hope we've seen tonight that very much an extension from last week. Um, we need to accept wisdom, understanding and knowledge into our hearts to change our natural imaginations and the evil thoughts of, of our natural man's heart. Dwell on that deep water, draw on God's word, to then speak God's wisdom, to be kind, to be pleasant, to have that grace and wholesome words. And we'll conclude. Sorry, I have got more references, but I'll skip over this. There's, there's so many other references in, in Scripture that talk about the mouth and the heart. So uh, you, can, you can look at them if you if you wish. But it's a, it's all the way through through Scripture, not just in the Proverbs of but the heart and mouth being so intrinsically linked uh, and what we do with our heart uh, influences the mouth. So to conclude, we just dwell on the, the words of Psalm, Psalm 19, as opposed to Proverbs, if, you, if you'll let me. Psalm 19, verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou from me secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Thank you.